Oh, we can all play, incidentally, another game we can all play this festival is, Martin, you've left your tuner on the microphone stand. Something I'm doing with alarming frequency these days. As uh, my memory is starting to uh, change. <laughs> One of the things you'll have to find out about folk music is that if there used to be quite a lot of rules about how you had to have a long beard and an Aaron sweater and a receding <laughs> forehead. And uh, quite often you have to sing with a finger in your ear like this. Like that. And if you, uh, there was one guy at the Woodford who actually sang with a finger in both ears like this. And I don't blame him, because he was fucking awful. <laughs> Okay, we'll go. First of Australia's managed to catch up with Martin Pearson, who's here at the National Folk Festival, uh, a, a stamping ground for you for many years, Martin. I've been to every one of them at the exhibitions uh, park here. So when it moved to Canberra in, I'll not, not get the year right, but it was no, 19 years ago it moved to Canberra, there was one year at the university, and then the next year it came here. And I was at the first one and I've been called them since. So take us back to that first occasion because that was when the, the, all the festivals from around the country yeah. actually came, came to here. Uh, it used to travel around mm. uh, the national. Uh, so the first one I went to was at Karanda, in the rainforest up in far north Queensland, uh, where it rained because it was a rainforest. And there were posters there that said, um, in the unlikely event of rain, all events will be held undercover. And so as the weekend progressed, uh, the graffitiists were changing that to, in the unlikely event of rain, all events will be held underwater. Uh, and the campground flooded out and everything flooded down. It was, I mean, but it was fantastic. It, did, it just didn't matter. But they did take a bit of a hit because of the uh, loss of tickets. And so it was moving around. It went to South Australia the year after, I remember. I don't, there was an inter interim one. I can't remember where that one was. And then it moved to university in Canberra and they decided to keep it in one place. Okay. So the first year at Exhibition Park I came from Townsville on a bus, it took me about a day, <laughs> uh, just to be, come and have a look, be here. Because, did you have a gig for the first festival? No, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, I, I played at yes. uh, Blackboard Vineyard, but um, I, I wasn't booked for the first one, okay. booked for the second one. Yes. And, Every one since. Okay. Well, you've had a. Um, I mean, we've been privileged to be following you for many years, and on off whenever we see you around the traps. So, uh, you've had a, it seems to be quite a, a, a complex and an interesting musical journey. So take us a little bit through some of your influences as far as that, because a, a lot of people will come along and they, they want to see the comedic. Mm. Well, I was. I was a folk, it's much more, isn't it? I was a folk singer first. Yeah. Uh, I heard. An album called Plain and Simple by John Munro and Eric Bogle when I was 16 and had really not understood that there was a kind of music that really appealed to me like that. I wasn't from a musical family, so had no sort of musical influences like that. And I uh, didn't really even know this, this kind of music existed until I was, heard that album. Uh, but it was still eight years later before I found a folk club. Because I didn't know folk clubs existed either. But just, you just don't. It's not with me. They're, they're, it's not like they are. They have great marketing uh, ability. So I was living in Perth. Perth, plain and simple. Fell in love with it. Learned all the songs. I taught myself guitar um, so I could learn all the songs. Then went uh, gradually. Ended up in Townsville. I stayed to one places. And uh, I was singing in a crapery in. West Townsville. Does that sound right? Yeah, it's down on the Strand there somewhere. I just remember it made crepes, which was just odd in Townsville at that time. It was a long time ago, you know. A bit lardy da I would have thought. And uh, a lovely Austrian woman called Linda said, you're seeing folk music. I said, have I? I'll have to take your word for that. Cause... And she took me to the folk club. Uh, so I went to Townsville Folk Club and sang three songs for them and they all applauded and I went, oh yeah, that was fun. <laughs> I'd learned that song once again without knowing that it was a folk song. It just really appealed to me. Yes, yes. Mm. So, so with the um, those early days, you, you found this inspiration. You know, there's a community out there as, as disparate as it is, yeah. and hiding away in small so, dark places, etc., right. etc. Et so, you, did, did what point were you conscious of deciding? Think, well, this is for me. I'm going to give this a go and see if I can make a quit out of it, or no. was it something that just no? It certainly, 
never really considered that um, it was going to be a career. I mean, I'm still not entirely sure it is. But uh, it was a love performance. I mean, when it comes down to it, I'm a performer before I'm a uh, singer, or a, and certainly a singer before I'm an instrumentalist, because in that order, former singer, instrumentalist third. I'd give up guitar tomorrow if I could. I, I don't get, I mean, it's not that I hate playing guitar, I just, I just don't get any, you know, the people. Uh, the first single I bought was a group called The Flying Pickets, and they, they were singing a song called um, Only You, which was a pop song by a group called Yazoo, but it was done in, I didn't like the Yazoo one, but I liked the six-piece a cappella one, and I had no, no idea why, I just, that's what I liked, right? Uh, there was a guy called Mike Harding on television, because I grew up in England, not in Australia. Born in Australia, grew up in England. And there was a guy called Mike Harding on television, who I used to watch religiously, and didn't know at all that he was a folk singer, and, until much, much later on. But he sang, uh, the band played Waltz Matilda, because he'd just come from Australia and learned it uh, from Eric. And uh, I remember that just being... And I, I didn't know... Of, at that time, that Eric Bogle existed, because I, that was still pre-Finding Plain and Simple, yeah. the album. So, yeah, so I picked out all these little bits of music, uh, quite inadvertently, not knowing that they were actually folk songs. That's extraordinary. So they came together from all over, mm. over the place, and they sort of... I heard a Harvey Andrews song. I heard, I heard okay. a, a guy called Harvey Andrews, yeah. a wonderful English songwriter, yeah. but very intense. You can't listen to much. You have to listen to one of his songs and then go have a little lie down yeah. and come and listen to the next one. They're wonderful, but my goodness, you know. They're, oh. And I heard this song he's, he wrote about a Northern Irish soldier called The Soldier. Um, about the guy who threw himself on the grenade to save that train load of people in uh, Ireland. And so I'd learned that song, once again without knowing that it was a folk song, it just really appealed to me. Yes, yes. Mm. So, so with the, um, those early days, you, you found this inspiration, mm. you know there's a community out there as, as disparate as it is, yeah. and hiding away in small but, dark places, etc, right. etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, you, did, did, what point were you conscious of deciding, think, well this is for me, I'm going to give this a go and see if I can make a quid out of it, or no. was it something that just... No, it certainly never really considered that um, it was going to be a career. I mean, I'm still not entirely sure it is, but uh, it was a love performance. I mean, when it comes down to it, I'm a performer before I'm a uh, singer, or a, and certainly a singer before I'm an instrumentalist, because in that order, former singer, instrumentalist third. I'd give up guitar tomorrow if I could. I, I don't get, I mean, it's not that I hate playing guitar, I just, I just don't get any you know, the people around here who are beautiful guitarists and love their guitars and, you know, spend all the time explaining what kind of guitar it is and how it has these strings and does this. And I just don't do any of that. I just, you know, I, I'm lucky if I remember to change my strings <laughs> before a festival. Well, I'm, I'm sure I have a recollection of being either here at the Folky or one of the other festivals around the place where you were speaking about the fact you were actually going to come to grips with the guitar. Yeah. And at that stage, you... You were thought, well, you know, I think you said, well, this is my ambition over yeah. this next period of time. I'm going to actually get to know this. I'm going to learn an F. With an F. <laughs> with the full bar. Hey, with the full bar. <laughs> I remember doing that. Yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a while ago now. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, certainly when I started, it was I was playing three chords and mm. singing songs. Mm. The first gig I did, which was at a troubadour at Mulaney, that was the first solo gig I'd seen. A, my secret shame is I was a lagophonist in a bush band in Downsville. Oh, are you part of the world record attempt today? No. Uh, I put my shame for the past behind me. I've given up children. If you are tempted by lagophones in your life, <laughs> just say no. Uh, the yeah, so I'd, I'd been in a bush band, and then I was at, a, at one of the early Mulaney's, and Andrew uh, had a troubadour wine bar there, and he gave me a spot, and just said, "May I?" And he said, "Yes." Uh, and it, I was going to sing unaccompanied folk songs and comedy that I've written myself. And I looked down in the audience the very first time and there's in front row Danny Spooner and uh, Bernard Boland. So yeah, no pressure. 
<laughs> and uh, slight, slightly freaked out, but you know, just went, no, no, I can do this. I've never had stage fright, so that, I mean, that's really has been easy. That's not something, so you can actually just go from whatever yeah. you're doing and step on the stage. Yeah. And, I, I just, I mean, it's, I just through no particular skill or learned process, it's just, I'm lucky that I don't get stage fright. Is there an alter ego that's involved in when you actually step on stage? A little bit, yeah. not an awful lot. Right. Uh, the, we, I don't think many of the folkies performers change much when they get on stage and I, I don't think we really use older egos. Uh, I remember seeing Ted Egan in the bar up in Youngerborough and we were having a lovely time, you know, he'd, he'd actually just won the, the meat raffle or some such thing and he'd given it to someone, you know, and he'd sit in the bar with his uh, foster phone having drinks, singing songs, telling bullshit stories, somebody leans around the door and says, Ted, you're on stage, and he was—he just got up, walked to the next room where the stage was, got on stage, and simply kept going. I mean, he was <laughs> was absolutely no different to what he was doing. <laughs> it was just at this time they, they'd moved him on the stage, and a lot of them are like that. I mean, I just saw Mike Jackson walking past. He—he he is no less enthusiastic a human being off stage than he is on. So, do you know when you're going on stage, have you got kind of a mud map about where you're going? No, um, you no, no not, you not too much of one. Uh, I don't try to prepare too far ahead because, I mean, you don't know, you don't know what the audience is going to be like, you don't know what the weather's going to be like, you don't know what mood you're going to be in, so if you write a set list in the morning and then find out you've become hugely grumpy over the course of the day and you've filled the set with every song, you're not going to perform them right, because then you'll just sound like, <laughs> <laughs> Dance as you go, you know, right? So you can't you know. have no to be in a moment, you think you're not feeling a bit, I'm Rough feeling idea. a bit crappy, or I'm feeling really yeah. up-tempo, yeah. I'll just go yeah. for that and see what you know, see how the audience... Usually you pick first song. Right. You have a fairly good idea about first song, and usually, you know, you have routines or songs that you're doing uh, that are fresh in your mind. Like last night I played Hallelujah yes. to finish with Christina, but I, I actually haven't... I haven't had Al Boyer on the set for about a year now. Uh, but Christina was there, so you don't want to miss out on that, because she plays it beautifully. Um, but when I started, I'd, I'd actually forgotten the chords. It would have been no one to spread it. You know, as long as you don't panic about things like that, it's, nobody really minds. Just, I really think, I mean, especially at the Folk Festival, if you're on stage, don't waste your time just doing love songs. Sorry, whoever likes love songs, sorry. But you know, you've got to have some meat in it. You've got to have a bit of. It doesn't have to all be. Doesn't have to. You don't have to. I mean, there's no harm to dr to drag an audience through some deep political thing. They're they're adult audiences here. They can handle it. Uh, personally, I like I like to sing an intense song and then have a, maybe a little comedy break so that people can calm down a bit. But once again, the comedy break doesn't have to be idle. I mean, you can deal with the wailing or you can deal with a, a, a subject. Uh, but it does. It just paces out a little bit. And it means when you actually sing an intense song and a serious subject and try to make a point, uh, I, I think that's uh, it can be absorbed more readily, perhaps by a, uh, an audience who so this likes is a, you. So is it, is it sort of a um, <laughs> he's my friend. Do you, get, do you get angry about issues and then yeah. you kind of channel it into a oh, yeah. way that he can get the message across without a sledgehammer? But it, mm. is that oh yeah, I get, yeah. I get incredibly angry. Um, I've recorded Masters of War, I think that's probably the angriest song I've ever recorded. We're doing it at the uh, um, Bob Dylan, the uh, Facebook face in Bob Dylan. And uh, that's, it. I mean, the line in the middle there is, I hope that you die. And it is, I mean, you're singing it. You can't pretend you're not singing that. So I've, I've got to come to terms with the fact that I am looking at a person like John Howard, uh, and saying, I hope that you die. Mm. And do you mean that? Yes, I do. Mm. Because I'd die. I actually think the world would be slightly better if he was dead. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, yeah, another one, for goodness sake. I'll raise a glass. Uh, but these are people who killed thousands of people by their, uh, I mean, not, not through anything other than political motivation. To further their own careers, they killed people. Mm. So do I hope they die? Yes, I do. No. I have no qualms with that. And so, uh, that's, I, I can't idly sing a lyric. If I'm going to sing something, it really has, I have to mean it. Okay, so if you've got a song from another artist and you've mentioned a kind of a nice little lexicon of, of yeah. 
very prominent and, and very accomplished mm. folk uh, folk artist. Do you and listen to a song many times, or does it as soon as you hear it, do you go right? That's for me. I'm going to get. That. I um. I usually am grabbed by songs, words first, always words. Uh, but it's got to be un songs to be words in tune. You, you can't disconnect one from the other. The, for instance, I, yeah, there's a lovely songwriter in England called George Papavieris. You know the one, yeah. And uh, I had a couple of his albums. I usually listen to music while I'm driving around. I don't listen to any music at home. I just don't. I don't know why. Just don't. So when I'm driving, and I had uh, you know three of George's CDs, and I had I wasn't singing one of his songs, and he's a fine songwriter. So I drove along and just said, "All right, George, talk to me." Put the put the CDs in and just started listening to them to try to find a song that connected. So, for instance, he's got a lovely song called um, "Flowers in the Guts," where the, the people are putting the flowers in the barrels of the guts. Beautiful song, beautiful imagery. I wasn't there in the 60s, so even though I love the song and the story, it means nothing to me. It would be pointless me singing it. Um, the one in the end that connected with he has a song called It Takes a Soldier to uh, Fire a Gun. Uh, and that was, you know, because I'm hugely anti-war, so that is, in fact, was a really good song for me and I um, liked the message in it. And so that was, that was one in the end that connected. And, and not that any of the other songs weren't fantastic, but they just, they must connect as well. Yeah. Yes, no good seeing something you don't believe in. The folk scene's changed a lot over the years, Martin. Fair amount. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Tell us a little bit about some of the positive aspects of that, or things which you be maybe, maybe... There are more people here. here. More people. <laughs> <laughs> more people here than ever before. Yes. Yes. That's a good thing. Uh, the... I think the folk movement is probably politically tied in with the Green Movement, I think it's reasonable to say, and the Union Movement as well, of course, so left-wing politics. Uh, and it has helped, my belief is it's helped strengthen that in Australia. Uh, at the moment it's wobbling a bit, I think uh, there's, a, like I say, a few too many, a few too many love songs and not quite enough uh, tub thumping that we need a bit more angry in our next generation. There's some lovely bands like The Lurkers, uh, young men who are doing, started off with a lot of Pete Seeger, Pete Seeger stuff and uh, writing their own songs about political comment. Um, yeah, so I think, I think we're going to be all right. This you, week is, you optimistic for the future? No, oh, okay. it's, it's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, nothing, nothing we can do is going to kill it. There's a lovely quote uh, by John just walked past, he reminded me of it. There's a guy called Martin Carthy in England, you know, and they said, you know, uh, there's all these versions of folk songs. Do you like versions of folk songs? Uh, it is how, how can folk songs be damaged? And he said, the only way to damage a folk song is not to sing it. Absolutely. So as, as long as we're passing these things along, I think we're going to be all right. So do you do a lot of collaborative work with others? I know you work Not with too much, with no. John, John yeah, we had a duo called Never the Twain for, right, for yeah. quite a long time. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a trio called the MP3, which we uh, had. But uh, not too much, no. I mostly just work for myself. Are you a prolific writer? No. 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 I write maybe two or three a year, something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's only uh, a, a rare thing. I don't, I don't actually consider myself a writer as such. Other than that, I said parodies. So, how did the, the actual the idea of the parodies? I mean, is something that uh, stirs you? Yeah, that something makes that you a bit cranky, you, or, irritated. Or, or, uh, irritated. <laughs> so, so, yeah. The muse of irritation. Right. It's just the ones going, ah, oh, oh, bloody fucking. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when you thump the table, it's yeah. usually, usually that what leads to a song. Yeah. But I did, uh, a little while ago, I did an entire parody suite called The Unfinished Spelling Errors of Tolkien, uh, just because of my love of Tolkien, yeah. and uh, I wanted to get it down. And so I wrote nine, that was actually a, a very uh, interesting process, because uh, it was a nine parodies you know, to our show. And that, that was, uh, you know, when you talk about the passion for it, well, it's, it's an equal passion, but it on, on a different level. It's a, not a political passion or an angry passion, it's just really loved the stories and wanted to uh, do something with them. So that was uh, that was fun, a slightly different thing. So you're, you're, only a, you're only a young fella still, but you've 46. been involved in... Okay, well, they say you're halfway through your career, possibly, mm. at this stage. Um, how 
when when people think about you as a performer, mm. what what do you, what is there anything in particular that you'd like to be? I, I wish I keep trying to avoid saying remember. Yeah. For, but do you know? But something Not when they talk yet. about Mark and Pierce, because I you know I've got the sort of young son yeah. street, and they always say, oh, God, that's me, Martin, because he's you know he's great and he's laughing, he's you know yeah. cutting edge and stuff like that. But there's there's more to Martin Pearson than, than that. Uh, yeah. I don't know. You'd have no. You'd have to ask an audience member. <laughs> To be, to be, yeah, to be fair, it would be, I, mean, I, have a bit of, I have an opinion of what I am, but that wouldn't be the same as anybody else's. Well, what's your, what's your opinion? How would you describe yourself? Not, not in the sense of, a, look, I'm going to slot into the programme, although if you don't differentiate between yeah. one thing and another. How, how would you describe yourself in a couple um, of sentences? I'm a folk singer, uh, and part of the deal with the folk singing is the tradition, living tradition, so you sing songs from the past, but the bit I think that gets forgotten is we also have to be picking songs from the present to, to move on to the future. So even, I mean, maybe that's you know, what I, I think perhaps my job is also to go put it in front of an audience or put in front of a session, here's a song which I think could be a good one, mm -hmm. and not all of them work of course. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that's part of the job as well. So I think we mustn't forget the, that we're trying to move it on to the future as well. It's not all mu museum pieces, even though the museum pieces are beautiful, and we must keep them. Mm. So, uh, well, just a couple of questions to wrap, Martin. Um, mm. Firstly, uh, have, you, have you ever had a real uh, a gig which has been totally just totally bombed out? Um, oh, horrible, you mean? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, but not folk festivals. No. No. It was okay. Back in town till it, the Rising Sun Hotel was probably the worst thing I ever did. It'd take way too long to tell you all about it. <laughs> but uh, the, the first thing that happened to me as I walked in was I stuck to the carpet. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of yeah, where it was going after that. Uh, it, three uh, Martin Pearson songs mm -hmm. that you've done, which feel, you feel to date, of yeah. course, because I mean, there's three a year, we've got mm. more to look forward to. Oh, so right, the ones I've written. The ones you've written so yeah. far, if you had to pick three, and that was, if you say, well, okay, Martin, we want you to give us your, your best, yeah. of, of best of Martin, what would they be? Hmm, quite interesting. I think the Pope song was a very good one, because that got a lot of information into a, a song, so a huge theme down. And, and as well as that, it was just fun for people to listen to. The final song of the Lord of the Rings suite, the Lou Break song, was, if I might say so myself, a masterpiece <laughs> of, of word cramming. So I think that that's probably a good, like a, a craft piece, like a guild piece, you know, if it was a... Um, the Three, three people, a contemporary, either mm. contemporary or no longer with us, yeah. that you'd like to appear on the same bill with? I think I already have. <laughs> ah, well, there we are. Well, Eric, certainly. Eric and John. Uh, but I've done that, so they're old. Yeah, has been now. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I had to go, uh, how about Billy Connolly? I wouldn't mind doing that. But mostly just to meet him. Uh, same bill, same bill, same bill. Victoria Wood. No, can't think of another. Okay, it's a comedian. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, Billy Connolly was a folk singer before he was. Of course he was, yes, he is. He was. All the best ones are. Yeah, very much so. Uh, where do you see, see Martin Pearson in 10 years' time? Um, not sure. <laughs> that's, a, that's a much trickier question than you'd believe. Okay. Right. <laughs> you'll, you'll find out more about that. Okay.